We are finally going to Elbaf. Elbaf, the legendary kingdom of giant warriors. Elbaf, the home of one of the most fearsome, most strongest armies in the world. Elbaf, the island of our dreams. The mystical kingdom of Elbaf is one of, if not the most, eagerly anticipated islands in One Piece. It is perhaps only second to Laugh Tale as a destination that we fans have been dying to see. One that we've been waiting for ever Ever since we were first introduced to the Elbafian giants in the Little Garden arc almost 25 years ago. And since that epic brush with those legendary warriors, we've received more and more lore to build up our excitement for this legendary island, and it seems that we are finally getting that sweet release. Personally, I can't believe that we're finally here, and I'm also trying to not get too sappy and emotional about how this adventure now means that we are really truly in the end game of the series because I can't help but feel that that is the case. But we are only going to focus on excitement here. And actually, what's really been on my mind amidst all the excitement and anticipation, I've actually been wondering what this arc has in store for us. I mean, after almost 25 years since its introduction, and after all those chapters of intrigue and build-ups, what can we actually expect to see at Elbaf? What do we need to witness being resolved? What sort of answers are you seeking? And what do you personally want to see, to feel satisfied after finally arriving at this island that we have been wanting to go to for so long. And before I tell you what I want to see, a routine reminder to please subscribe if you haven't already. I've been discussing One Piece with you all for quite some time now, and although it hasn't nearly been as long as we've been waiting for the Elbaf arc, I strongly feel that it would still be very satisfying if this channel reached 100k subscribers, and I'm sure for you, witnessing my my happiness at achieving this feat, I'm sure that will give you satisfaction too. Or at the least, then I'll finally stop reminding you and interrupting our discussions, and I'm sure that that's gonna be satisfying. Okay, what are we gonna see at Elba? First thing that I think we can all agree on, Usopp needs to have his moment. Usopp has gotta make big moves. Our boy has to get some legendary level ups. Usopp's goal is literally to be a brave warrior of the seas, and in his eyes, the Elbafian warriors are the epitome of brave warriors of the sea. Elbaf is Usopp's island. Elbaf is Usopp's ark. It always has been. This is something that Oda has been building up for for almost, again, 25 years. And we've been reminded of this throughout the series, even in chapter 1123. Usopp is seen exclaiming, ecstatic, exhilarated that we are finally on the way to the island of his dreams. It's the peak and pinnacle of his dreams. And we have to see that pay off. I'm not sure what that will exactly mean for Usopp. You know, I don't know how we'll actually witness him becoming this great brave warrior. And look, the argument can be made and has been made plenty of times that Usopp already is a brave warrior in his own right. He has proven himself over and over again throughout the series, but he still obviously also needs to further build his strength and abilities, especially as we face this final saga. So in that context, does this then mean that we need another conflict, another battle where Usopp will be able to show up and showcase his bravery? Because personally, I am on the fence as to whether that will happen. I think it's possible that we may not actually be getting another great big battle at Elbaf. I mean, we've just had a very substantive battle against the Gorosei at Egghead Island, and so for me, it just feels a little bit too soon to be jumping into another great conflict, another big fight. And so maybe that just means we're gonna get another mini arc between Egghead and Elbaf, you know, similar to how we saw the reverie between Whole Cake Island and Wano, like a nice interlude, a nice break between two mega arcs. But also, on the other hand, I also think it's possible that Elbaf might be a bit more of a downbeat arc, a little more chill, a little more relaxing, an arc that is less centered around tension and conflict, and one that's just more focused on training and learning and lore. 
for. And personally, that's actually what I would love to see. I would love it if El Buff was a primarily training arc. I think it would make a lot of sense because of the nature of El Buff. We have one of the strongest armies, giants, who we have seen time and time again to be leaps and bounds stronger than regular humans. If our crew is supposed to be training up against these giants, if they're training in a world where everything is literally mightier and larger, quite literally out of the bounds for many of our straw hats, I think that would be very satisfying. You know, Wano did result in major level ups for many of our crew, especially so for the monster trio. But after this recent clash with the Gorosei, I think it's clear that we still do have a long ways to go. And of course, going back to focus on our man, on our boy Usopp here, I'd say there hasn't actually been a great focus on Usopp since the Dressrosa arc. And I would say that's because Oda has been waiting for this next L buff arc to go all out for Usopp. So I would love to see Usopp's next power up. And as to what that level up, what that power up is going to be. I was actually speaking with another fellow One Piece YouTube content creator, Randy Troy. Shout out to him. We both had very similar ideas about the significance of Luffy's gear fifth form, about what his Nika form truly is, where its true potential and capabilities lie. And we both had this idea that basically the significance of the Nika form isn't just Luffy unlocking his Nika, his gear fifth, his most free imaginative form, but the true significance is his ability to allow other people to do the same and how he inspires other people to unlock their most free. And that is exactly what we saw in the case of Bonnie and her unlocking her Nika form. Now I go into the details about what this actually means in another video so feel free to check it out. But the reason why I'm bringing all of this up is because Randy, he suggested to me that he thinks Usopp will be the next person to achieve this and that he would really like to see Luffy affect and inspire Usopp to unleash his ideas idea of being most free. And in that case, we're going to see Usopp in his Nika form being a great brave warrior of the seas. And that would be the most symbolic showing of Luffy's abilities if he was able to inspire Usopp of all people. And I've been thinking more and more about this idea and I have to say I am in love with it. I'll settle for him awakening Conqueror's Haki or maybe even just Armament Haki. I mean both are after all manifestations of one's willpower. And at the end of the Egghead Island, arc with Joy Boy's fermented ancient Haki Blast. That's confirmed something that Kaido mentioned towards the end of Wano, that Haki is ultimately what is needed in the world, that Haki is the ultimate strength, and so it'd be great to see Usopp unlocking other forms of Haki, and that also could be a major power-up for him. Because at the end of the day, I think more than just physical strength and abilities, I think what Usopp really needs is true confidence and true belief in himself. Not just the false bravado that he often puts on to, you know, build himself up. I think he needs to believe and recognize that he doesn't need a mask to become a hero. He just needs to acknowledge and recognize that he already is a hero, that he already can be a hero just by being himself. And again, we have seen him rise to the occasion countless of times, but I just love for it to stick. I'd love for us to witness a major point, a major turning point in El Buff, one that marks a complete shift in Usopp's character development. And actually, given how I was saying that I'm not really expecting this great big conflict, great big tension or a fight, I think what we could get instead might be that towards the end of the arc, something breaks out. Some sort of tension breaks out towards the climax at the end. And it's in that moment that Usopp rises up, stands up for the occasion. And we see that everything he's been struggling with, everything that he has been battling with throughout that training arc, that's all put to a test. And just when he is needed the most, Usopp stands up and he proves once and for all that he really is a brave warrior of the seas. But seeing as I've been mentioning Gear 5th multiple times already, we may as well discuss it. Gear 5th, Nika and the Elbafian warriors understanding and knowledge of Nika, this has to be addressed at Elbaf. So to the great surprise of fans, Dory and Broggy recognize Luffy's Gear 5th form as Nika upon their arrival at Egghead Island. And now in retrospect, I think that actually shouldn't have been all that surprising. We did 
already know that they have a sun god of sorts because the Albafians are a race that are heavily inspired by Nordic Vikings. They seem to have similar cultural beliefs and traditions, most notably is the Winter Solstice Festival. And the Winter Solstice Festival in the context of One Piece, in the context of Elbaf, is that it's a tradition for the Albafians to pay respects to, to the sun, in particular recognizing the death and the new birth cycle of the sun. So we already knew the sun is a long-held and highly esteemed deity almost in Elbaf already. The fact that they know of Nika already, the sun god. Again, I think that does make sense and shouldn't have come as a surprise, but it's also not clear whether Nika is the same sun god that they're necessarily celebrating during these festivals. Anyways, seeing as they already know about Nika, seeing as they hear, and not just hear, but actually recognize Luffy's Gifith heartbeat as the drums of liberation, in fact, the giants were seen dancing to this rhythm. Almost Almost as if this is a tune that they've grown up with. Maybe it's the drum beats that's played at every winter solstice festival. So all of this seems the giants know a lot more about Gear 5th and Nika. And actually not even just the lore surrounding Nika, but around the world more generally. The giants also seemed to recognize Emeth, not Emeth specifically, but they at least acknowledged him as the Iron Giant. And this is quite distinct to the rest of the Straw Hats who were just calling him a giant robot. It's as if they're already knew what sort of being Emmett was. And so all of this suggesting the giants actually know more about the lore of the world, which too also makes sense. Given that giants live for a lot longer than humans, they are sure to know more about the ancient traditions, ancient secrets, all the mystical workings of the One Piece world. Even the events of the Void Century, which happened 800 years ago, that's the equivalent of around roughly 40 generations for usual humans. Whereas for giants, that would probably represent only around five generations. There might even be a giant's grandparents or at least great-grandparents who might have actually been alive during the Void Century. Not to mention even more recent events like Emmett's attack on Marajoie which only occurred 200 years ago. There are some Elbafians who would definitely remember that event. Now Dory and Broggy, they're only 160 years old so that attack still happened before their time. But it would still be relatively fresh for the giant race. You know, Dory and Broggy could have heard about the Iron Giant's attack on Marajoie. This could have been a tale that they were told at a very young age. So anyways, that is a long-winded way of me saying, yes, I think we are definitely en route to receive some heavy lore dumps. Vegapunk also started telling the Straw Hats the significance of Luffy's Gear 5th format egghead. So it's fair to assume that it will be at Elbaf that the Straw Hats continue to learn about this Nika form. And I can't wait to see how Luffy reacts to all of this. I mean, I'm chuckling already. It's gonna be like, wait, are you guys talking about me? You're talking about my gift fifth form? This is just my heartbeat. What do you mean this is significant? But in terms of lore more broadly, Vegapunk also confirmed that the special races in the One Piece world, they have a more significant tie-in to the events of the Void Century. And so the giants maybe to shed more light on the relationship between the giants and the Ancient Kingdom or the giants and Joy Boy and how those relationships might have affected the other kingdoms or in particular the 20 kingdoms. Now, now, of course, if we're thinking about all of this lore, all of these secrets, we now also know that the secrets uncovered by the O'Haran scholars are now being stored at Elbaf. This means that Robin is going to have access to that immense trove of knowledge, meaning that we really are en route for some very heavy lore dumps indeed. I think we're going to find out the name of the ancient kingdom at Elbaf. That seems to be one of the greatest finds of the O'Haran scholars. That was a revelation that cost close over's life. So I really can't wait to find out what that is. I do have some thoughts on it, which I have shared in another video. I'll link that below as well. But now that we're thinking about O'Hara, something that we have to see at Elbaf is that reunion between Robin and Jaguar D. Saul. Prior to that revelation at Egghead that the books of the O'Hara scholars and that Saul himself survived the O'Hara incident that bust the call and that they are now all being kept at Elba for safekeeping. I don't think prior to that, any of us were expecting expecting that reunion, but now it is practically guaranteed. I think this also explains why Oda has been dealing so much emotional damage to Robin as of late. Not only has she had to relive painful memories in the Egghead Island arc, we also saw her being tormented by these apparitions of Saul 
of Olvia back at Wano. Now it makes sense that Oda was setting us up for this really sweet release because now we can finally see her being happy and reuniting with one of her oldest surviving friends. And obviously with these lore reveals, with her access to these books, this should also be a major arc for Robin as well. I would say that Robin also played a relatively small role at Egghead, so I think Oda has been saving Robin to get a bigger role in this Elbaf arc, similar to Usopp. And especially now that Clover has been revealed to be one of the D-Clan, can we expect the same for Robin? Is it gonna be Nico D Robin? Something else that I think has been set up during the Egghead Island arc, which I think could be well addressed at Elbaf, that's the connection between the Giants and the Buccaneers. Again, the fact that special races are significant to the history of the One Piece world, that's something that's been emphasized. Buccaneers in particular have been singled out throughout the Egghead Island arc, and we know that the Buccaneers have the blood of giants that they're somehow related. So I do expect this relationship to be fleshed out some more. Initially, the popular speculation was that Joy Boy himself might be a giant or a buccaneer, and that's why Kuma's people have been persecuted throughout history. Now, the recent silhouette that we saw in chapter 1122, that suggests that the Joy Boy as a buccaneer or giant theory seems to be less likely, but whatever the significance is, what better place to reveal it than in the home of giants? Now, while we're still focusing on the lore of it all. I also expect more to be revealed about the Sunlight Tree Eve and the Treasure Tree Adam. It's been highly speculated that the Sunlight Tree Eve, which has its roots in Fishman Island, that the top of that tree will be located at Elbaf. Continuing with that tree lore, we also have the giant Jack, which we saw at Skypea, and that must be rooted somewhere below, somewhere on the Blue Sea or on Earth or the One Piece equivalent of Earth. That might tie into Elbaf's history. We know that the Adam tree survived and became the strong, mighty tree that it is because it's the tree that survived countless wars, countless decimations of an entire nation, an entire people who just kept rebuilding their nation around this surviving great tree. Maybe that's going to be the ancient civilization story of how the Elbafians came to be. Maybe in ancient times before the advent of humans, regular humans. Maybe the giants were fighting each other, different tribes of giants, because we do know that they exist. Maybe it was the Elbafians versus the ancient giants, for example. And the reason why the Elbafian giants are known to be this strong warrior race could be that they've withstood countless millennia of fighting. It might even be possible that the Adam Tree, the Sunlight Tree Eve, and the Giant Jack are all actually just one thing, and different groups of people call it different names based on what they know of the tree. Or if they're not just the one tree, they're at least heavily related, closely intertwined. Because I do think that trees are super important in One Piece, like very, very important. I've actually made an entire video just focusing on trees, and I highly recommend you check out that video as well. Well, again, all of the links will be down below. Anyway, sort of related and sort of not, but when we start talking about trees, especially in connection to Elbaf, something that always comes up is Yggdrasil. Yggdrasil, for those of you who don't know, is an element from Nordic mythology. It hasn't actually appeared in One Piece yet, but because, like I said, Elbaf seems to be heavily inspired by Nordic mythology, many have speculated that Yggdrasil, the tree of life, that that's somehow going to play a part in the One Piece story. And I don't know about Yggdrasil in particular, but I am heavily expecting a lot of references to Nordic mythology and Nordic culture. We saw a ton of Japanese folklore and traditions in Wano, and that also certainly wasn't the first time that Oda has drawn from real life inspirations. So I'm very much expecting the same for Elbaf, whether that's Yggdrasil, whether that's Jorgenmanda, or any other deity figures. We already know Oda's love for Viking culture. That is actually what partly inspired him to create a pirate series. And so I'm also personally really excited because I also really enjoy Nordic mythology or mythology in general. In fact, I've made a video on that as well. But in general, I think that's always a lot of fun. And seeing as Nordic mythology has come up, we already have one example, that example being Prince Loki. Now, Prince Loki is a figure that we definitely have to see at Elbaf. Loki is the prince of Elbaf. You know, he's part of that royal 
royalty. And I find that really interesting because I think this means that we might find out a lot more about the political and social structures at Elbaf as well. And that's always very exciting. Another anime slash manga series that I really enjoy is the Vinland Saga series. And that's all to do with Viking culture and royalty and the political tension and struggles. Now, I don't think we're going to get quite the same here because Loki seems to be quite loved by the Elbafians. You know, the Elbaf giants were even willing to let go of their hatred for Linlin just because of their respect and love for Prince Loki. And Prince Loki is obviously a very, very important character because otherwise Oda wouldn't have just drawn him as a silhouette. And by now we know that Oda, he gives that silhouette treatment to the very important characters. So what is it about Prince Loki that makes him so significant? And in connection to Prince Loki, I think we would be remiss not to mention Big Mom and her children, especially Lola and Chiffon. I'm not expecting like a major comeback for Big Mom here, but I think there will be some sort of mention, some sort of offhand comments. There has to be some sort of tie-in and we might find out more about Big Mom's time at Elbaf. I'm also not expecting any major involvement from Shanks personally, but I am again expecting Shanks' lore about his relationship to the Giants, about his time spent at Elbaf. I think I have mentioned before that the reason why Shanks seems to know so much about the world isn't only because of his relationship to Roger, but I think a large part has to do with the fact that he learnt so much from Elbaf. Now because we did see that Shanks and the Red Hair Pirates actually left Elbaf very recently, again I think it's gonna be quite some time before we actually see Shanks being personally involved at Elbaf. I don't think we're going to get that very similarly long anticipated reunion between Luffy and Shanks, or even Yasop and Usopp for that matter, but we definitely have to find out more about Shanks and the Red Hair Pirates. In fact, I think this could actually be what catapults us into the next arc following Elbaf. Like I said, I'm expecting or hoping for Elbaf to be a primarily training arc, but I think towards the end, if we hear that Shanks has been tangled up in some bloody conflict with Blackbeard and his crew, that these two Yonko are in fierce battle and they're both in the final leg to reaching Love Tale and the One Piece, I think that might be what spurs the Straw Hats into action and what leads them all to go maybe to rescue Shanks but in any case that's what's going to result in the next arc. But speaking of Shanks that also reminds me I'm really looking forward to seeing some interactions between Luffy and that giant kid that giant Luffy-esque kid that we saw with Shanks at the bar. The two could just share and swap stories about Shanks how much they both love him how he's just the greatest I think that would be a lot of fun. I'm sure they both have a lot of funny stories. I don't know if you can tell but right now I am really just looking forward to a lot more of the light-hearted fun aspects and the fun qualities of One Piece. And I think the Elbafians are such a jolly race. I think we can expect a lot of that. I mean, every arc has a lot of comedy and there's a lot of comic relief, but I think we're also in a unique position here. It's not like Dressrosa or Wano, or even to some extent like Egghead, where the Straw Hats have to be in a position of saving people. The Straw Hats were saved by the Giants in this case. Elbaf is the perfect place for the Straw Hats to sort of let go, let loose, learn from people much stronger than them, and learn not out of necessity because they're in conflict with the Elbafians. Like I said, I think we could have a bit of a downbeat here. We could just relax, and I wouldn't mind that. Anyways, this next one that I'm expecting isn't really specific to Elbaf, but I am very excited for Lilith's role in the next arc. Now that she's traveling with the Straw Hats, I think she's going to be a very useful guest or traveling companion, perhaps the next potential straw hat. And actually, especially as we are heading to Elbaf, as one of the Vegapunks, I think she'll be really helpful in shedding more light on the lore, but also as one of the more feisty, one of the combatant satellites. She should also be able to help out with the training. And actually, as one of the satellites, Lilith could be used to tell us more about the gigantification research and experimentations that were done. We know that the world government has funded Vegapunk to do research on Giganification. And again, that should help us understand more about the lore of the giant race and its connection to the world. And so with Lilith here, that should be very fitting and a very convenient way for us to find out this information. Also, if Lilith doesn't become a straw hat, if she isn't a forever companion, Elbaf could actually be the perfect place to leave her. And I think she could fit in at Elbaf and make a home for herself quite nicely because this way she could continue the Stella's legacy in researching the void history, finding out more secrets of the world,
world, what with having physical access to the O'Hara and Scholars Library, especially if Punk Records is blown up so she can't access that knowledge anymore, or even if the world government become aware that not all the satellites actually died, that a Vegapunk still exists outside of York. I think Lilith being at Elbaf, that would be a pretty good deterrent. And that might make the world government think twice before pursuing Lilith. Again, the Elbafians have been mentioned to be one of the strongest armies in the world. In the past, we've seen that the Marines have actually placated to the Elbafians and act in fear of angering them. So her being at Elbaf might actually be enough to stop them from actively coming after her. And the same actually goes for Bonnie as well, who is currently traveling with the Straw Hats. If Bonnie doesn't stay with the Straw Hats, which may be more than likely given her young age, then Elbaf would similarly be a perfect home for Bonnie, especially because of that Buccaneer giant connection. It's also a country that believes in Nika, and it's also a perfect island for her to continue training and developing as a combatant. Now, you may have noticed that ever since the time skip, there's always been at least one supernova in focus in every arc, and so I think we should expect the same in Elbaf, and Bonnie might continue to play that role as being one of the worst generation, but I also personally think that someone else is going to get involved. I think the most obvious answer might be the reprisal of Kid, especially seeing as the last time we saw Kid and his crew was just off the coast of Elbaf, and I don't think Shanks actually killed him. So maybe we'll just get an update on Kid, but we might also just get an update on Law, but if that was the case, I don't think Law would actually be at Elbaf. It'll most likely be an update on sort of what's happening around the world, and we also see Law as a part of that. So then another one of the supernovas who is highly speculated to make his reappearance is Uroge, and Uroge is expected in Elbaf primarily for two reasons. The first reason is that he is the only one out of the worst generation who haven't played a major role in the story since the time skip. The rest of them have been heavily featured in arcs. And because Oda did have big roles for each of the supernova, we can expect the same for Uroge. But also because of what I mentioned earlier about the connection between all the special races, in particular the Buccaneers, the Giants, and then we have the Giant Jack, and Uroge being one of the Sky Island people. His unique heritage might mean that that plays a role into the story somehow. Another supernova, another one of the worst generation that might at least get mentioned is Beige Capone. We might get an update on Beige now that he's married to Charlotte Chiffon, Lola's twin sister, the twin sister that Big Mum actually tried to pass on as Lola in the attempted marriage to Prince Loki. So maybe we'll get an update on Beige. Maybe Beige himself will reappear. But something that I I am absolutely sure that we'll get, and something that I'm really excited for, is new costumes, new outfits for the Straw Hat crew. I am expecting a lot of typical traditional Viking clothing and gear. I'm thinking boots, I'm thinking helmets. For the ladies, we already have some precedent as to what they might wear in the form of gird, or is it gerd? Anyways, I'm expecting the ladies to be scantily covered in just a little bit of fur and boots. Oda is going to do a lot of fan service. I am sure of it. Egghead Island was heavily focused on butts. I think the focus in Elbaf is going to be in the upper region. I think the focus is going to be on boobs. I'm picturing olden style corsets that's going to really prop up the ladies. Whereas for the men, I really can't wait to see them wear their helmets. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. In general, I think it's going to be a really nice contrast to the really high tech tech gear that we've seen in Egghead. All the clothing, all the machinery was so futuristic. And while we don't really know much about Elbaf, buff at this stage. I'm expecting a little bit more traditional olden style stuff. And in that respect, I am really excited to see more of the culture and the society at El Buff. We have seen glimpses through Big Mom's flashback and such, but we really haven't seen their geography or culture get fleshed out to a great extent. And each arc, each island is always so unique in their ways of life, in what sort of culture they have, what sort of geography exists. And like I said, with El Buff being heavily inspired by North Nordic Viking culture. I think it's going to be really a lot of fun, especially for me because I love middle age history and Viking history fits very well in that period. So on a personal note, that's something I'm really going to enjoy. Something else that I am expecting or what I would really love to see are some callbacks to Little Garden. In particular, I hope we get a rerun of that Zoro and Sanji rivalry that was so beautifully and hilariously cemented in that Little Garden arc. You know, the two boys, mirrored the hundred year battle between Dory and Broggy in their hunting competition. And we already know that Elbaf is home to large wild beasts.
beasts. So not only would I like to become more familiar with the unique wildlife, as I said, I'd also love to see some sort of like minor plot development, some sort of commentary, something that focuses on this initial rivalry. You know, just classic Zoro and Sanji antics. Because if you've been around in this channel for long enough, you know my absolute favorite thing about One Piece are the straw hats. I love nothing more than just seeing classic shenanigans that they get up to. Doesn't have to be so high stakes, so high conflict. I'd just love to see them hanging out. And again, I think Elbaf is the perfect location to, to display those classic straw hat relationships. Anyways, that's been my long list of expectations and hopes for this next Elbaf arc. Or I guess, like I said, I'm not 100% certain that Elbaf will be the next arc per se, but I think that Elbaf is most likely, most definitely the next arc island for the straw hats so these are all the things that i'm expecting to see or at least hoping to see let me know if i've missed anything or let me know if you agree with me as to what i'm anticipating make sure to leave a comment below please do like the video if you've enjoyed today's discussion and also again please do subscribe i would really really appreciate it i also want to show my appreciation to all of these wonderful people who are supporting the channel by becoming a patreon or channel member thank you as always and thank you all for sticking it out this long listening to all of my ramblings. I'm sure as our journey into the final saga continues, there will be more to discuss. So again, make sure to subscribe, click that notification bell so that you can keep tuned into all of our discussions and I will see you very, very soon. Bye.